All right, guys. Good afternoon. Now that we've had our boys to men service, <laughs> the bombets for boy. Mazel tov once again to the bombets for boy. All right, guys. Let's get started. Sixteen weeks. We're going to be reading every week one chapter of the Didache. Kaspar uh, was telling me those of you that stayed for the classes are very dedicated. <laughs> true story. True story. Very dedicated. That sounds uh, very Kaspar-like to say. If you're if you're Italian, the book is called the Didache. Right? So we're studying the Dedeche. Now, what on earth is the Dedeche? I did send out an email to you guys with a bunch of videos that you can watch, and hopefully you guys were able to watch that. But um, for those of you that weren't able to watch it, I want to give just a little bit of an intro as to what the Dedeche is and why on earth do we even want to study it today. We're going to spend 16 weeks, uh, one chapter a week, and some of the chapters are short. I mean, the whole Dedeche itself is actually quite short, right? It's not much longer than the... Um, the book of Galatians, for example. So it's quite short. And it's instructions. It's very different to any other text in the Bible. Um, but um, for some reason, it fell out of use due to Christianity, I would say. Uh, it was a little bit too Jewish for them, I guess. And it fell out of use. And it's one of those things like, um, imagine if you could ever rediscover a book of the Bible that was lost. That's what the Dedeche is. And there's a beautiful story about how they rediscovered it as well. So what we've got for you guys to follow along with, I did send out a copy of the Dedeche to you on the email. So if you want to follow along, you can take it out on your phone. Yeah, on the right. WhatsApp that I sent, you can go there into the email. Um, maybe I'll go into the spam folder because you don't like me. <laughs> but it is there. Okay, check the WhatsApps. Check on your WhatsApp. The newsletter is on there. Uh, if you want to, I've got a link there where you can download the translation of the Dedeche and you can follow along as well. So please find it there on your phones it's, if you need it. You don't have to follow along. I mean, if you guys want to listen to my voice for the next two hours, you should go see a psychiatrist, first of all. But also, you can find it there so you can follow along. The Dedeche. <laughs> That's the, yeah, the multiple voices in my head again. Yeah, exactly. All right, so um, we're going to be using this commentary over here. This commentary from our good friend Toby Janicki. It's very thick, very heavy. It's called The Way of Life, commentary on the Dedeche. The rediscovered teaching of the 12 Jewish apostles to the Gentiles. So he spent many years putting together this commentary because uh, it's not the first commentary we have on the Dedeche. There's many commentaries over the years, but those are usually done by some random monk or Catholic priest. And when they're reading a book of the Bible, just like the rest of the Bible, very often they end up misinterpreting it because they don't understand the context, the Jewish environment in which it was written, and they don't understand the audience and how things were meant to happen. So this is really the first Messianic Jewish commentary that we have on the Dedeche, and probably the most profound one. I mean, look how many pages there are. This thing is thick. So if any, guys, if any of you guys want to buy it, we do have it in our bookshop. We also have something else here. We have a little student workbook that one day we'll do. Um, it's meant to be for teenagers. Uh, so you can read the Dedeche and answer some questions about it and get to know the Dedeche. But before we can teach the teenagers about the Dedeche, we have to teach the adults. So no, that's why you guys are here. All right, so I'm going to read a lot to you guys today. Uh, most of the stuff's going to come from this book, but at any moment, please feel free to interrupt me, ask a question, let's discuss it, let's learn about it. So I'm going to give you the full-out uh, introduction to the Dedeche so you understand what it is, and then we'll get into chapter one, reading what the first chapter is about, and uh, uh, then we have an overview of what's going on with the Dedeche. Any questions right off the bat? Stephen asked the question this morning, why were humans created? And I thought, nice topic, dude. <laughs> Chose the easy one for yourself. All right, no questions. Okay, so here's the introduction. Uh, it's worthwhile to read this, in, in, this introduction as well, so stick with me. Uh, if, you guys, if you guys do get tired, feel free to go make yourself coffee, please. Uh, don't feel bad about leaving the table to get coffee. Okay, so let's get going. Since its recent discovery, the Didache has become an... I'm going to call it Didache... I guess it's Didache probably, because it's uh, the Greek Kai, I think. But I don't know, I'm used to, I'm used to calling it a Didache. Uh, so it's, uh, since its recent rediscovery, the Didache has become an increasingly popular book for both laymen and academics alike. Academics like yourselves. It has drawn the attention of Jewish, Protestant, and Catholic scholars, and it's steadily gaining broad appeal to the average Christian reader as well. Despite the fact that the book itself is actually quite short, no longer than the canonical book of Galatians, its surprisingly vast number of articles and books have been written in attempts to try and decipher its content and origin. The book's decidedly Jewish content, coupled with its early date, make it authentic, uh, make it an authentic window into the life of the earliest believing community during a time when the community was still firmly planted within Judaism, which is extremely important for us today. Because today, if you look at what we're practicing, this whole messianic mess that we're all in, it's quite new, right? It's only been around for, what, 20, 30, 40 years maximum. So uh, we're finding ourselves at a similar point um, as what the apostles did, where for the first time, Gentiles were coming into the Jewish faith 
and they had to figure out how to do things and how to run congregations. So for the last 2,000 years, we spent a lot of time forgetting about that. And here we are again, finding ourselves at the exact same place. It's the same thing over and over again, hey? It's, like, uh, it's almost as if there's a cyclical thing going on here. Right, the title, Didache, means teaching, and it's taken from the first word of the book. The work is also known by the longer name, the teaching of the twelve apostles, or even longer name, the teaching of the Lord to the Gentiles through the twelve apostles, which is the complete first line of this book. The Didache consists of 16 chapters, although we treat the entire work as one homogenous unit. The academic community often refers to the first six chapters as a separate unit called the two ways which quite probably existed in some form before it was incorporated into the Didache. It appears that some early church writers refer to the entire Didache by this title as well, the two ways. So you'll see these first six chapters that we're going to spend here. We'll be discussing this idea, this concept of uh, the two ways or the two roads or the two paths that a person can follow. And um, what they're saying here is that that wasn't necessarily in the writings of the Didache. That seems as if it was a teaching itself, possibly, from the apostles themselves, that they learned from Yeshua, this idea of the two ways. And that as a unit was then added into this thing, or it was at least used as a starting point for composing what we have as the Didache today. So that's the first six chapters, and then from chapter 7 up to 16, that's when we get to the more, um, I want to say pastoral kind of things, things about how to deal with congregations. What do you do with a guy that comes in and says, hey, I'm an apostle, let me stay with you and have free food for a week. Or stuff like that, right? Then it comes into the prayers. How do we approach the prayers for Gentiles who are coming into the faith? Can you say the blessing of the eating that says, thank you, Hashem, for sealing a covenant in the circumcision with me, if you're uncircumcised? So there are certain problems that the, the, the Gentile community needed to deal with as they came into the fold. And that is what the Didache is about. It's there to help address those and help us now figure out our way through this sea of religion that we have to try and sort out. But the first six chapters, we're going to spend some time discussing more ethical things. Uh, about the, the, the choice of life. Okay, so here's some history about the Dedeche. Uh, it enjoyed popularity among the early believers. Early church writers mentioned it and quoted it uh, from it frequently. For example, Clement of Alexandria. Ever heard of that guy? No. No. Clement. They named the fruit of them. <laughs> Clementines. Uh, Clement of Alexandria. He is from about the second century. Very early. One of our... Should we call him a church father? John, can we call him a church father? He is, he's one of the church grandpas. Basically, right? He's, he's like one of the first church fathers. Uh, Clement, there's uh, two epistles that many Bibles actually have called uh, First Clement and Second Clement as well. So, so there was an argument whether that should be in the Bible or not. He was a disciple of John, wasn't he? No. Is it a different Cl Clement? That's a different Clement? That's a different Clement. That was Clement? Clement of Rome. That was Clement of Rome. Okay. That's very comfortable. Thank goodness John is here. All right, guys, if you have any questions. <laughs> Pass out there. All right, anyway, so Clement of Alexandria, 2nd century, who is the earliest to mention the Didache, he seemed to regard the Didache as scripture. To him, it was scripture. When he quoted from it in his Tromata. Another guy, have you heard of Origen? Origen. Origen as well, he was the early mid 3rd century. He treated the Didache as scripture as well in his first principles while he was living in Alexandria as well. But it appears that he changed his position after he moved to Caesarea, where the book was not viewed as canonical. Eusebius, heard of him? Eusebius is very important for us. Uh, Eusebius, he's got this wonderful writing called Ecclesiastical History. And that's where we find our history of how Christianity started. He, uh, that's where we find our history of what happened to the apostles after the Bible was written. Um, and what happened to the communities at that stage. So Eusebius, 3rd century, he also mentioned the Didache by name, along with the book of Revelation, which we do have in the Bible, as one of the books that some accepted as canonical and others rejected. So even the book of Revelations, there was a bit of dispute whether we should have it in the Bible or not, including the Didache as well. A guy by the name of Anthanasius, ever heard of him? Nope, me neither. Uh, no, not anesthetic. Anesthesia. Anyway, probably him, Athanasius. Yeah. Third century, uh, he listed the teaching of the Twelve Apostles as one of the books not indeed included in the canon, but appointed by the fathers to be read by those who newly join us and who wish for instruction in the word of godliness. So I guess he viewed it like a bit of a different type of material than the rest of the New Testament. I mean, you look at the New Testament, most of it is uh, letters with instructions and beautiful teachings and stuff. The Didache is very different because the Didache is literal, do this, 
and don't do this. Do this and don't do this, except for the two-way section. And the two-way section does kind of appear throughout the Gospels as well. So um, he decided, okay, well, maybe we should have it and give it to the people when they become believers, but it doesn't necessarily need to be in the canon. If they put it in the canon, it would have saved us a lot of effort. We wouldn't have all this discussion about whether it's legit or not. In the late 4th century, Rufinus of Aquilia described the two ways as read in the churches, but not brought forward for the confirmation of doctrine. Uh, a guy by the name of Didymus the Blind, 4th century, he mentioned it by the title, The Teaching of the Apostolic Catechesis. Uh, how many of you guys went through Catechesis back in the day? He says back then this was used before the Dominis found their version of Catechesis. That is the right word, eh? What do you call it? Catechesis. Yeah, yeah. Why are they doing cats into it? Right. Uh, the Didache also appears in a reworked form in the late 1st century Apostolic Constitutions. We're going to be quoting this thing, the Apostolic Constitutions, quite often through our study as well, which accounts for the confusion of the two books in later church literature. The Apostolic Constitutions was kind of like a commentary on the Didache. It has its own commentary on the Didache. Very much like you'll find with the Talmud, you've got the, the Mishnah, and then you've got the Gemara. The Gemara is commentary on the Mishnah. So too, the Apostolic Constitutions very much functions like a commentary on the Didache itself. Uh, however, by the 5th century, the Didache fell out of popularity in church literature and was therefore referenced much less. Uh, the catalog of the 60 canonical books in the year 600 Common Era mentions the travels and teachings of the other apostles, which is believed to be the Didache as well. Uh, the, uh, the stichometry of uh, Nicephorus in 850 Common Era, I'm pronouncing these names completely wrong by the way, listed it as a rejected book as apocryphal. The last known reference to the Didache was from a guy called John Zonaris in the 12th century and Mathgens Blastaris in the 14th century. But both of them mentioned it in such a way as to appear to indicate that they did not have access to an actual copy themselves. Now, the two-way section of the Didache shows up separately in several early church documents. It appears along with the contents similar to Didache chapter 16 in the early 2nd century apocryphal Epistle of Barnabas. You guys know who Barnabas is? The one who traveled without Paul. So there's a epistle called an epistle of Barnabas. And this two-way section appears in that epistle as well. That epistle, scholars have got lots of issues with that. Because it seems like there's different authors. Different sections of the epistle of Barnabas. But the fact that it's got this two-way section in there. Maybe is an idea as to what happened. Uh, it says you're placing it in competition with Clement of Alexandria's Stramata. For the earliest patristic references to the Didache material. The two ways is found as well in the Latin Doctrina Apostolorum which is something from Harry Potter, from the 2nd century, uh, another important early textual witness to the Didache. It also is found, quoted, or reworked throughout early church literature in documents such as the Apostolic Church Ordinance in the year 300, uh, in, a, in Arabic Life of Shinuate, whoever he is, 5th century, and the Rule of the Master, 6th century, and Chinese Jesus, Messiah Sutra, 7th century. Have you ever thought of that? Chinese Jesus. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Let's have a sushi brocha. If you've been to Nazareth, you would have seen him. If? If you've been to Nazareth, you would have seen him. Oh, the Chinese. No, 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 no. So, but there they must have the church of Mary. Yes. We were having in the different religions, yeah, yeah, cultures, yeah. <laughs> Chinese Jesus. Let's not make jokes about that while I'm recording. Okay. Well, why did the Dedekai fall out of use? Scholars speculate that the primitive concern of itinerant apostles, prophets, and teachers, coupled with its meager ethical, ritual, and ecclesiastical provisions, were too archaic to be reconciled with their contemporary practice. In other words, instead of answering why contemporary church practice did not reflect the instructions in the Didache, the church discarded the book as antiquated. Uh, antiquated. It's basically too old, right? Uh, the organizational structure of the church had moved far beyond the simple communities and concerns reflected in the Didache's document. As we shall see, the Didache was meant to introduce new Gentile initiates into the world of Jewish monotheism, to Torah life, and to Judaism. Objectives that made the document no longer applicable to fully developed Christianity. Once it became its own proper religion, with its own rule makers and its own laws and its own traditions, separate from Judaism, the Didache didn't mean anything to them anymore. It was no longer someone coming from a world of paganism into the world of Judaism. Now you've got Christianity, which is creating a world of monotheistic believers as well. So in a sense, it kind of makes sense as well. Over time, it fell into obscurity and into oblivion. They considered it Christianity for dummies. So they said, no, we don't need that in the canon. We don't need to study it anymore at all. Additionally, the Didache functioned as a primitive church order and so was continually updated 
to keep it relevant for the communities that used it. For example, the apostolic constitutions and likewise the Ethiopic church order utilized the Dedeche, updated what they wanted to keep, and discarded what was no longer relevant. How do you like that? Lovely. Take what you like and spit out the rest, eh? Cherry picking. Yeah, cherry picking with the Bible. Elements of the apostolic constitution and other church orders can be seen in modern catechisms. This means that some of the teachings of the Dedeche, or minimally its function as a primitive church order, laid the groundwork for what became the modern church orders. So while the Dedeche itself was lost, some of its teaching can still be found in some church documents even till today. So there's an amazing rediscovery of how we actually found the Dereche again. We thought it was lost for centuries, and in the year 1873, some guy called Philotheus Berenios, that's a cool surname, eh? Berenios, he must have had a big head. No, he went and found it somewhere um, in, uh, in uh, where was it? Which library was that? In Istanbul, there we go, in Istanbul. Yeah, I thought it was Constantinople. Istanbul. Okay. So you found it there in that library of the Greek Covenant of Holy Sepulchre in Istanbul. Now, although Brenius' manuscript includes the only complete version of the Didache found to date, other older fragments of the Didache have been discovered since. In 1922, two Greek fragments containing sections of the Didache were discovered in Oxyrhynchus, Egypt. Have you ever heard of that place? Oxyrhynchus. Anyway, here's a photo of how it looks like. Uh, my apologies that my book looks so skew. Something happened to my book. I found it last week outside in the rain. No idea how it got there. It was just lying outside there in the rain. <laughs> so a bunch of my pages have got destroyed. The wrong way. <laughs> well, yeah, he took the, chose the, not the way of life. Uh, page four. Um, halfway down, bottom paragraph. All right, so um, the nature of the text, now categorized as the Oxyrhynchus papyrus, was very close to the version found by Brenios, thus helping the sol uh, to solidify the accuracy of the Codex. These fragments date back to the late 4th century, making them the oldest Didache manuscripts found to date, and some 650 years older than the Codex Heriosolimitanus. We're going to make up nicknames for this stuff, eh? All right, a Coptic fragment from Cairo, Egypt, was also published in 1924. So if you want to know about the whole story of how he found it and how he discovered it, please go watch the videos that I sent to you guys in emails. He gives us the whole background and the story of this Berenius guy who he says his name is too difficult to pronounce, so we call him PB. Anyway, so it's wonderful to go check how they found this thing. I mean, can you imagine that feeling of finding pretty much a lost book of the Bible that has been missing for hundreds of years? It's and he, at first, at first he saw it and was like, nah. That's not interesting. And he went and read some of the other stuff. And eventually, he told people, oh, I found this thing. And they were like, what? You found the Dedeche? He's like, what's the Dedeche? It's the thing that all our early church fathers were quoting. That we've been looking for for years. Like, oh, yeah. It's in here somewhere. And he eventually went and looked through it again. Now, a nearly complete Gregorian version of the Dedeche, lacking only sections 1 verse 5 and 6 and 13 verse 5 to 7, was also found in Constantinople in 1923. Okay, so that's a little bit of the background. Now, the composition date of the Didache. When was it written? Most scholars generally agree that the Didache was probably written either in Egypt or more likely in Syria or even Judea, sometime between the late 1st century to the early 2nd century. Some speculate that it, or at least portions of it, may have been written as early as the year 50, common era. That would mean that the Didache could contain material that is actually older than the Gospels the canonical Gospels, and was written during the generation after the Master's death. That's super early. Before the Gospels that we have today, it could have been written in any way. So remember, before the Gospels that we have today, the canonical Gospels, there was different Gospels that were floating around as well. We call them the sayings Gospels. So the early community, they didn't write the Gospels as we have them. They would just write down the actual sayings of Yeshua, and they would send this around, all the teachings of Yeshua. One of them was known as Matthew. This was original Matthew, not the Matthew we have today. The Matthew that we have today is that Matthew plus commentary, plus a bunch of extra commentary. So it's like kind of like, you know, those red letter Bibles where they only have the, the words of Yeshua in red letters. You can make the version of Matthew like that sort of, but it's still, we don't have that original one as far as I know. There are actually some claims that they have the original sayings Matthew as well. And um, there's people that want to teach you that um, their religion is right. So they come and claim that one is the original Matthew and all these things. Don't be careful of that stuff. But just so you know, there was a Matthew that existed before the Matthew that we have. Okay, and this one was one of the things that the Didache, around that time, that was already passing between people. Matthew wrote that when he was on a journey somewhere. And uh, that was passing around in communities. And then the Didache might have been written at the same time as well. 
Um, as with the Gospels and with rabbinic law, the contents of the document probably circulated orally before it ever landed in the Didache written up. In fact, its very structure suggests a mnemonic device lingering beneath the surface. So our sages did this a lot. When they were giving their teachings, and we studied this a few weeks back as well, our sages would actually give us these mnemonic devices. They would uh, give you like little riddles or rhymes to help you memorize their teachings. Right? So they would tell you, Sunny, see a sucker out that whole story. That's to teach you about the salt of the earth that you bring on the sacrifices, stuff like that. They'd make up these mnemonics about stuff so you can memorize their teachings. The Dirge seems to have an underlying mnemonic structure as well, because it was probably first passed on orally. Yeshua does the same thing in the Sermon on the Mount. The Ashrei statements. Happy are those. You can actually sing the Ashrei statements. So Yeshua did the same thing so that it would be a mnemonic device so that his disciples could remember his teachings wherever they went without it even having to be written down. Um, while the Didache contains sayings of the Master, uh, it appears that it preserves a strand of oral tradition independent of the earliest oral traditions of the canonical Gospels. So the Didache could even be from before the Didache, you know, we don't see the Didache quoting the Gospels as we have them necessarily. So it seems that it was written before their source where they got their Gospel saying from Yeshua from. So that's very interesting. Okay, so some others speculate that Paul himself actually knew about the Didache and referred to the Didache in Romans 6 verse 17 and Titus 1 verse 9 as the teaching. Some even suspect that Paul used the text of the Didache in his writings. In particular, the opening chapters referred to as the two ways. It's a speculation, but it's out there, just so you guys know. Uh, all right, so authorship. Who wrote the Didache? When examining the material of the Didache, there is nothing to identify the Didachist as anything other than a Messianic Jew. The longest title of the Didache, the teaching of the Lord to the Gentiles by the Twelve Apostles, would have, us, would have us believe that the Didache contains instructions that were transmitted by the Apostles themselves through the halachic authority that was invested in them by the Master himself. Now, as we're going to discuss, uh, the Didache was the natural outgrowth of the Jerusalem Council's rulings regarding uh, Gentiles in Acts chapter 15. It seems reasonable to suggest that the Didache represents the teaching, traditions, and legal decisions authored by the early heads of the Jerusalem Assembly, such as James, the brother of the Master, and Simon, Clopas, Simon, son of Clopas. Now, alternatively, we might connect the Didache with the Apostle Barnabas. We mentioned him earlier, right? Paul's original traveling companion. Before Paul was ordained as the Apostle to the Gentiles, Barnabas was the one who had that commission. He was the one going to the Gentiles before Paul. The Apostles in Jerusalem had sent Barnabas to Antioch to investigate claims about Gentiles becoming disciples of Yeshua. Barnabas might have penned a basic catechism and primer in ethical monotheism for the new Gentile believers. The two ways section of the Didache. And one of the reasons why they believe that maybe Barnabas was the author of the two ways section is because of the fact that we also find the two ways section in the epistle, the apocryphal epistle, epistle of Barnabas. And then some random pope found it so many years later and decided he's going to add his own stuff into the epistle of Barnabas and he's going to claim that it was Barnabas that said this, you know, power hungry, this does stuff to people. No. Okay, now whether or not the Didache actually goes back to Peter, to Barnabas, or to another of the apostolic authorities in Jerusalem cannot be ascertained with any confidence. But at the same time, when one compares the teachings of the Didache to the New Testament, it seems certain that the essential thrust of the book follows the same path as the teachings of the apostles and breathes the spirit of the Master Yeshua. One of the most compelling reasons to view the Didache as a first century document that could be linked back to the teaching of the apostles is the inherent Jewish nature of this text. This is a quality lacking in most other early non-canonical works. The Didache represents a community that was still living within the ambit of Torah and which uh, a high degree of continu continuity with a mother religion is preserved. The Didache preserves a time when believers in Messiah were still within the fold of Judaism. So that's why we probably lost the copies of the Didache in later Christianity because they no longer had any interest in following uh, Judaism and its practices. Right, so that's, I think, all the intro that I want to give you guys. Uh, oh, one more thing. Halakha for Gentiles. So this is one of the things that I think is so attractive for us in studying the Didache, is the idea that now we can finally put together Halakha for Gentiles. I get this question very often. Can you give me a list of which laws do apply to Gentiles? And my answer is no. I don't have that list. Well, actually, it's in the Torah. 
You just have to go and mine them out and put them in a the document and find someone called Rambam, say, yeah, publish this, so we can always quote you for the rest of your life and say you put together this list for us. So the Dirge helps us actually understand a little bit about how to derive halakha for Gentiles as well. Now, at the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, the apostles made a legal decision that Gentiles who came to the faith in Messiah should not be compelled to legally convert to Judaism and become responsible for the full yoke of the Torah as Jews. And Paul had to write a whole letter to the Galatians about this when there was a group of people trying to say, you all have to convert or else you're going to hell. That's what the book of Galatians is about, saying, no, you don't have to convert. It's not, the, the whole mystery of the gospel is that the, the Gentiles are also invited into the commonwealth of Israel and into the kingdom. You don't have to become Jewish in order to be saved. The whole reason why God chose the Jews was so that they could be a light unto the nations. I had to try and communicate that to Judah this week. He came back from school um, on the Tuesday, because remember Wednesday was Shavuot? And he said, tomorrow I'm staying home for Shavuot, but not the other kids, they're Goyim. <laughs> like, oh, that sounds a bit harsh. <laughs> so I had to explain to him, hey, but your job as a Jew is to be a light unto the Goyim, so you should be telling them to keep Shavuot as well. No. Anyway, so uh, our apostles explicitly stated four initial prohibitions in Acts 15. Sexual morality, food, sacrifice to idols, things strangled, and blood. However, the brevity of the ruling left a major vacuum. Are you guys happy with just four? Or just seven? Yeah, the, what do you call it? The... Uh, the Noahides, they say, keep the seven, go to heaven. No. <laughs> right. So it left a vacuum very much like it does today. What else should be required for the Gentiles as they progress in their faith? They would certainly need practical guidance for everyday life and community. What should their fellowship look like? Should they have a shul service? Should they create something we call a church service and get a band with a fog machine and a disco light? No. How would they apply the priestly dues and tithes in the diaspora, if the tithes technically only apply to a farmer in the land of Israel when the priest is among you and the temple is functioning. How should that apply? Right? How do you guys tithe if you're Gentiles living outside of Jerusalem? When should you pray as a Gentile? Should they do the exact same prayer services? How should they pray? Can they use this section that talks specifically about the Jewish people, etc., etc.? These questions all arose. And all these questions are answered in a Didache with such simplicity and Jewishness that one can almost feel the heartbeat of the apostles beneath the Dedeche's instructions. This adds to the probability that at least some key contents of the Dedeche do indeed go back to the oral traditions and the legal rulings of the apostles. Okay, so that's my introduction for you guys. Now you know what the Dedeche is, how it got here, why it got lost, etc., etc. So God willing, um, I, I personally think every Bible that's published should have this at least in the appendix. Because I believe that this, you know, we'll, as we study it, you'll see the Jewishness behind it and you'll realize that this is one of the only non-canonical books that makes sense in the messianic idea of thinking, the fact that we're still living within Judaism. So I think it's very important. So we're going to be studying uh, one each week. The first six chapters aren't going to be so much halakha and rulings and answering the question, what does apply to a Gentile? The first six weeks only will be a little bit more about ethical teachings, but from chapter 7 onwards, we'll get into the minutia of Gentile halakha. For example, let's have a quick look. Um, I can't remember. Chapter 7 starts off with discussing the laws for baptism concerning immersion. So we're going to study that in chapter 7. How should immersions be done? You should be fasting on the day before you immerse. What if there's no water because you live in the Karua? How do you do baptisms? Can you just throw a guy with a rock? Moses hit the rock, remember? No? Yeah, so we'll get to that when we get to chapter 7. Uh, chapter 8, we'll talk about fast days. How to do fast days, uh, according to the apostles. Um, don't pray like the hypocrites. And you, you know, certain days you're not supposed to fast. We'll get to that. Chapter 9, we'll learn about giving thanks. The blessings before and after eating. Now, we sang a bunch of them today. Stephen led us in the prayers today. And uh, there's some of them that, as a Gentile, doesn't necessarily apply to you. There's certain verses there. I mentioned the one earlier about the circumcision, for example. That's in that blessing. There's one about the fact that God gave us the land of Israel. Did God give the land of Israel to the Gentiles? No, he literally gave it to the opposite of Gentiles, Israel. That's the definition of the opposite of Gentiles, Israel. So, that, you know, there's problems. If you want to come into this Jewish faith, there's a few things in the prayers that are not going to apply to you. So what should you say instead? And that's where we get all those additions that we have in our book at Hamazon. We thank you, our Holy Father, and the Yahavoh, Chen, Ve'yavod, Awalamaze. All that stuff that we sing comes straight out of this Didache. So there's a chapter, uh, chapter 9 and chapter 10 has got that, the blessings before and after eating. Chapter 11, 
We learn about new people that come into our congregation, teachers that come past our communities, and how we're supposed to treat them, uh, how we're supposed to pass judgment in our communities. If someone claims to be a prophet, how do we stone him when we found out he lied? Stuff like that, you know. Interesting stuff. Uh, <laughs> listen to this one. Whoever might say to you in the spirit, give me money. <laughs> what do you do with someone like that? All right, uh, chapter 12, uh, we'll learn about... Um, the teachings of the apostles and different teachings that are coming away and uh, how people were, they call them here a Messiah peddler. Remember in the early communities, the very first congregations, they were very vulnerable to a bunch of guys that had no claim whatsoever. As soon as you guys came, left the church and came into the messianic circles, you guys were probably in the most dangerous spiritual area of your life. You were susceptible to anything. Because everything you learned in the church in the last few years was a lie. So how can I trust anyone? You know, here's a YouTube channel that makes pretty videos. Let me follow this guy. Oh, here's another one with more pretty videos. And you've got all these weird teachings coming in. And how do you know which one is correct and how to discern? This was a problem that these communities had as well. And said back then, they didn't have YouTube. The guy used to take the, the food tube. He used to walk to these congregations and say, I was an apostle. I was, saw Jesus myself. And he gave me the Holy Spirit, etc., etc. <laughs> so give me money, look after me, and I'll give you teaching. This happened to them. So how do you deal with someone like that, it says? Uh, and about the true prophets. How do you tell the true prophet from a false prophet? Um, likewise, about your tithing. There's some instructions about tithing and how you will tithe clothes and all sorts of stuff that's not um, written in the Torah. The Torah specifically tells us to tithe only your crops, right? But... There's also a tradition to tithe more things. So clothes, oil, things like that. It discusses that in chapter 13 as well. And uh, in chapter 14, we'll be looking about gathering on the day of the Lord. Sunday worship or Sabbath worship or how on earth all of that functions. That's going to be an interesting one. And in chapter 15, we'll look at uh, designating overseers and administrators. About uh, the leaderships in these communities and these congregations, how they're supposed to be set up, and uh, where do deacons fit in, and why do deacons sound like beacons, all sorts, and all that stuff. Uh, chapter 16 is known as the Little Apocalypse, kind of like the Book of Revelations, a mini version of that as well. So that's what we're going to get to later, but for now, we're going to start off with a section known as the Two Ways, which is uh, quite appropriate. I mean, imagine, it's hard for us to imagine, because all of us grew up in Western society, in a Christian culture. We grew up in a monotheistic culture. So when you came from the church to Messianic Judaism, you didn't necessarily have too much of a change. Yes, there were some big changes, but you still believed in one God before this. These guys that the Didache was written for, they didn't come from Christianity because there was no such thing. They came from paganism, polytheism, right? Every day they would go and visit their 20 gods and give them each an offering or a sacrifice for whatever reason. That's the world they came from, and now they're coming in here. Where do you start with such a person who's now dedicated and said they want to give their life unto Yeshua and they believe in the one true God? What do they do from here on out? Is it once saved, always saved? You're saved. Now leave the conference and go back to your life and to your family with all the pagan idols and stuff. No. So we need instructions on how to live your life. And they've made a major life-altering decision to follow Yeshua. So that's why we start off the Dedeche with the section of the two ways. So let's get into it. Chapter 1. If you guys have got the book, we're on page 51. Or if you're following on your phone, you can just go there to chapter 1, verse 1. So I'm going to read the whole chapter, and then we'll uh, give you an overview of the chapter, and then we'll go into each verse by verse. And please, by all means, ask questions as we go through it on this next page, when we go through them one by one. And we can discuss it. Please share with us something as well, if you picked up any insights. So here we go, chapter 1, verse 1. There are two ways, the end one and end two. One of life and one of death. However, there is a great difference between the two ways. Now, the way of life is this. Firstly, you shall love God who made you. Second, you shall love your fellow as yourself. Whatever you do not want to happen to you, do not do to one another. This is the teaching about these matters. Speak well of those who speak ill of you and pray for your enemies. Fast for those who persecute you. For what special favor do you merit if you love those who love you? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? However, you are to love those who hate you and you will not have any enemies. Just give me a second. I see there's a problem here with the internet with the Zoom guys. Let me change to my data. Data. Yeah. All right, there we go. Uh, and, um, there we go. Now you guys can hear me again there on that Zoom. 
Sorry about that. Try to fix it. Okay, uh, 1 verse 4. It says, Restrain yourself from natural and physical inclinations. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other to him, and you will be complete. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two. If someone takes away your cloak, give him your tunic also. This all sounds very familiar, right? Mm-hmm. If someone takes away what is yours, do not demand it back, for you are not even able to get it back. Give to whoever asks and do not demand it back. For the Father wants to give of his own gifts to everyone. Contentment awaits one who gives according to the commandment, for he is blameless. How terrible for one who takes. For anyone who has a need and takes will be blameless, but one who does not have a need will give an account as to why he took it and for what purpose. And when he is to be put in, uh, when he is put in prison, he will be questioned thoroughly about what he has done, and he will not get out from there until he has paid the last pruta, the last penny. But regarding this, it has also been said, let your donation sweat in your hands until you know to whom to give it. Oh, All right, so the text doesn't seem that far. It seems like he's pretty much just summarizing a bunch of the teachings of Yeshua here. So let me give you guys a quick overview of this chapter. Um, it might not be that quick, but then we'll go into the line-by-line commentary and we can get discussing on these things. Okay, so this is the section of the two ways. Ethics versus theology. The Dedekai focuses not on what one must believe, which has become, for some reason, this is the main thing about Christianity, that you believe Jesus died for you and saved you from your sins. That's it. That's all you've got to do in Christianity nowadays. It's all about what you believe, what you think. That's not what you need when you're coming out of a life of paganism and trying to join a life of discipleship to the master. It focuses not on what one must believe, but rather on how how one must live, which is much more important, right? Uh, Its anonymous authors presuppose that his readers have already made a commitment to following Yeshua. They have had their life-altering epiphany and recognize Yeshua of Nazareth as the savior, not just of the Jewish people, but of the entire world. They must now be instructed as to how to walk in this way of life. It's the same as the giving of the Torah. When we were saved from Egypt, only then, once we received that salvation, did Hashem say, here's my laws and my rulings and my precepts. Keep them. This is the lifestyle I want you to keep now that you've been saved. So the same for the new guys coming out of paganism that have been saved by Yeshua and the work of His grace. They were also saved. But now that you're saved, now that you're in the house, there's a few house rules that you guys need to know about. And the way of life communicates that to us very well. The entire Dedeche is about navigating correctly the path that the new believer has just chosen. So uh, sometimes then when you read the Dedeche as modern believers like we are today, it might be a bit, he's like, I know this already, man. Because we, we don't come from paganism into monotheistic religion. We've grown up our whole life. Me and Ernie were there in primary school. And the guys were making us sing the songs and do these hand things to tell us about Jesus. I don't remember any of them. Ernie probably does. We'll make him dance later on the tables. <laughs> <laughs> remember those days in chapel? Yeah, I remember the day. Some naughty kid put off a stink bomb in chapel as well. They never caught him. It wasn't Ernie, by the way. <laughs> All right. <laughs> It was a board stink bomb, not a made one. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. How, how did you know I suspected it? It was, a chem- it was a chemical one. It comes in this little glass tube. It's like this weird little... Um, it looks almost like petrol color. Oh, why am I explaining it to you? I don't have a clue what it looks like. Anyway, so... <laughs> I'm looking at the homeschool kids. Oh, someone in your school is going to let off a stink bomb. <laughs> Homeschooling, that's dangerous. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> The notion of choosing the correct path or way of life was so intrinsic to the early believing community that one of the first names that they applied to themselves was the way. This was the name. Haderech was a name for our early believers. You know, we have got to call ourselves something. You know, when it comes to the census and they ask what religion you, what are we going to say? Well, we'll say, okay, MK is taken, so we can't be MK. We'll be the way. Haderech. Where's that country going? This is interesting, eh? Mm-hmm. They have a new government for the first, well, sort of. We'll see how that goes, eh? All right, the Dedeche focuses on the orthopraxies in much the same way as does the Manual of Discipline or even the Mishnah. So it's basically halakha for Gentiles, exactly what we're looking for. Now, some scholars are inclined to view the two-way section of the Dedeche as a reworking of an earlier Jewish work due to its thoroughly Jewish flavor and its context. Why, uh, context, uh, content. Why does it sound so Jewish? Because it is so Jewish. It was Jews that wrote this for the Gentiles who were coming to join their Jewish communities and practice the Jewish faith. 
So it makes sense that it sounds so Jewish. For example, in the last book of the Torah, just before Israel was about to advance into the promised land, the Lord set a choice before the children of Israel and told them to decide between two separate paths. Deuteronomy 11 and 30 it says, I'm setting before you today blessing and curse. The blessing if you will obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and the curse if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today, then you shall live and multiply. But if your heart turns away, you shall surely perish. Now this concept of the two ways is very intrinsic to Judaism. The book of Psalms, right in the beginning, it contrasts the way of the righteous with the way of the wicked. In Psalm 1 verse 6 it says, For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. But the way of the wicked is doomed. The book of Proverbs admonishes its readers to avoid the path of the wicked and the way of of the evil, and instead to tread on the path of righteousness. The prophet Jeremiah called the Jewish people to repent before the onset of exile, warning them that there would be that there are two paths ahead of them. Thus says the Lord in Jeremiah 21, verse 8: Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. And then we went into exile. The theme of choosing between these two ways continued in the intertestamental period. Right, so after our Old Testament, but before the Gospels came around, that intertestamental period. Uh, one of the most important examples of this was from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, it says in the community rule, one of those things that they've dug up there in uh, Qumran, uh, those born of truth spring from a fountain of light, but those born of falsehood spring from a source of darkness. All the children of righteousness are ruled by the prince of light and walk in the ways of light. Haderech. But all the children of falsehood are ruled by the angel of darkness and walk in the way of darkness. So there it composes maybe Yeshua with Satan, something like that, or the angel of the Lord with the, with the devil himself, um, saying one is the guy that's uh, running the toll gate for the way of life, the other guy runs the toll gate for the way of death. And in the way of life, the toll gate's free. No. Rabbinic literature is also replete with examples of this two ways thinking. For example, Rabbi Yochanan questioned his disciples about what constitutes a good way and what constitutes the evil way. We studied it just a few weeks ago with the Perke Avot as well. Um, Rabbi Joshua tells the following parable describing the two ways of life. He says, this is in Midrash Rabbah 30 verse 20. It can be compared to a king who constructed two paths. One full of thorns, briars and thistles and one with spices, the spice root. The blind walk on the evil road, so that the thorns add wound upon wound. But those who see walk on the good road, with the result that both they and the clothes they wear become scented. Your soul and your body, basically. God likewise constructed two roads, one for the righteous and one for the wicked. He who has no eyes walks in the way of the wicked and stumbles. The righteous, however, walk in their integrity, acquire a blessing, and so do the children after them. Therefore, the concept of the two ways of life was firmly rooted within Judaism and filled the pages of Judaism's literature. The Jewish disciples of the Master naturally tapped into that rich Jewish tradition when they penned the Didache. We even find it today in um, the Breslevers, the guys that follow Rebbe Nachman. His most famous teaching is that this whole life is a narrow bridge. You've got to be careful you don't fall off to the other way. Make sure you're on the right way. So it's everywhere in Judaism, this idea of the two ways. Because it was there in Deuteronomy. It was Moses' first teaching. So, um, you know, last week, uh, well, Wednesday, we spoke about the multiple voices of God and multiple tongues and stuff. Uh, tradition says Moses, when he spoke the book of Deuteronomy, he also spoke it in all 70 languages. This is Moshe, the guy who used to start stutter when God found him the first time. Eventually, God filled him with a spirit and he was able to speak in all 70 languages when he spoke the book of Deuteronomy. All right. Um, so... Um, the idea of this two ways, the fact that you're going on a journey, is very important. I mean, this is, helps us understand the purpose of this book. Why was the Didache written? For newcomers to this faith, this new journey that they were going on. So they started off by telling you, you're on a journey, and there are these two ways. And they're warning them ahead of, the way, uh, ahead of it, right? Because Yeshua tells us we have to count the cost of discipleship. You can't, once you've already put in your hand to the plow, now turn back and say, Ugh, you know, I'm not in the mood for this. Yeshua tells us before the time, he gives us that parable of the builder who calculates every little thing to make sure that all costs will be covered. Right? Or the, uh, the king that's going to war who counts how many people he's got working for him. Right? The builders back then were very different to the builders today. Nowadays, <laughs> after they finish building, they tell you, we've only used half the amount that we need to. But anyway, 
So it's the same idea. Prepare yourself for the way. All right. Um, the two ways theology was freedom of choice. This was Judaism's attractiveness to the pagan world. Because in most non-Jewish religions, you don't have a choice regarding what's going to happen with your life. Because it's written in the stars. The stars and the gods are ultimately the ones that determine the person's destiny in polytheism. When you come to this religion, you can't use the excuse, Oh, I am what I am, I is what I is. It was my star sign. Oh, I'm such a Sagittarius today. You can't use that ex- explanation when it comes to following this religion. You are in control of your own destiny, and it's up to you to choose which path you are going to take. The difference between the two paths is seen not only in what they contain, but also in how the Dedeche presents them. The don'ts are a list of actions to avoid, but the way of life is presented in the Dedeche in a far more all-embracing way. Here under the underlying attitudes that must inform particular actions. Uh, t- it's teaching us ethics, basically. Uh, the way of life is in keeping with the teachings of Yeshua, which emphasized an internalization of the Torah's ethical principles. Not merely the road compliance with God's commandments, but also the heart's attitude behind one's behavior. Should we keep the letter of the law? Of course. No one in the gospel is saying don't do that. But the spirit of the law, even our sages say, this, the, the Torah of Messiah is nothing in comparison with the written Torah. The, the sages say this in the Talmud, that the written Torah looks like a child's play compared to the Torah of Messiah. Are they doing away with the Torah? No, but they're telling us the spirit of the Torah is what we should be focusing on. And this is the idea of the two ways teaching as well. Uh, God's commands, uh, but also has an attitude. No, sorry. Uh, when a righteous heart lines up with the righteous actions, a person is truly free to choose the path that leads to life. So, uh, the idea of loving God and loving your neighbor are central to the Didache. Um, following its early mention of this, uh, these two commandments, the Didache dedicates the rest of the work to expounding upon those two commandments. If you've got newcomers to our religion and they ask you, well, what commandments must I keep? Let's quote Yeshua who says, these two commandments, loving God and loving your neighbor, are everything compiled into two. But this is your summary of the Torah. Remember that story of uh, Hillel, where the guy came to Hillel and said, teach me the Torah while I stand on one foot? And Hillel said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now go and learn the rest. There is his commentary. He came to Shemai and asked Shemai the same question, and Shemai said, Shemai, get away from here. Come with stupid questions like that. The 613 laws. You can't just learn them all in one foot. Anyway, why am I talking to a flamingo? That's probably what I was thinking as well. <laughs> okay, so, um, it's no exaggeration to say that everything else in the Didache flows from this headwater. As with the command to love God, the exhortation to love one's neighbor as oneself can, clearly, can really be seen as the fount from which the rest of the Didache's teachings flow. It was imperative for these new Gentile believers, and it is imperative for us as Yeshua's disciples today to write on our hearts these two great commandments and learn what it means to abound and walk in this messianic community of love. So we're going to be spending some more time on that in a moment. Uh, the Didache's reliance on the sayings of the Master, and for that matter the plethora of quotes from scriptures, uh, show us that the writer of the Didache is not asking us to rely on his authority, but rather, as he does, on the authority of Yeshua's teachings and on the words of Scripture. So even if you've got issues with the Didache itself and who wrote it, if it's real, if it's legit or not, everything it's doing is quoting from Yeshua. So it's a wonderful resource for us to use to try and get halakha for Gentiles from the teachings of Yeshua. I'm just wondering, why is it that for the Gentiles, you know, that commandment, and you shall love the stranger in your midst and your staff, it's not because they're the stranger, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. So we're going to get uh, to the minutia of the... So, yeah, yeah, that's a whole different commandment. Yeah, love the gear. Mm. Maybe. I, sp- I think it still applies, though. It applies in the broader one of love your neighbor, even without the stranger. Okay, so let's get into our commentary. We're going to go through the chapter verse by verse, and please, by all means, ask questions. Uh, if I don't have the answer, John will answer you. If John doesn't have the answer, then the answer doesn't exist. Okay. <laughs> Sorry for putting you on the spot, John. You might want to add some brandy to that Coke. <laughs> All right, so let's read the verse number one. Let me just go back to page, what was it, 51 where we had the whole thing. 
All right, page 51. It says, uh, these are the two ways, one of life and one of death. However, there's a great difference between the two ways. I don't think there's anyone that will disagree with that, right? Eh? I mean, that's a very solid biblical thing that we've read over and over again throughout the Bible, including all the quotes that we just had. And of course, we know about it from that uh, verse in Deuteronomy, at least twice in Deuteronomy, Moses does that. It says, uh, I put before your life and death, choose life. Okay, so let me read to you some of the commentary. Please feel free to shout out if you want to say something. These words appear to be based on a tradition going back to the master, his own, the master himself, his own instructions. In Matthew chapter 7, Yeshua tells us, Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide, and the way, haderech, is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter it by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Now, a later work such as the Epistle of Barnabas end up spiritualizing these two-way teachings. Listen to this. He says, Now let us transition to yet another kind of knowledge and teaching. There are two ways of teaching and authority, one of light and one of darkness. However, there is a great difference between the two ways. For over, over the one are assigned illuminating angels of God. Right? These guys don't work for ESCOM. <laughs> but over the other assigned angels of the adversary. Likewise, the one way is that of the Lord who is from everlasting and forever, but the other way is that of the prince of this present time of evil. So we also find this idea of the, these two angels and two angelic beings in Talmudic tradition as well, that there's one good angel and one evil angel. Any ideas where we find this? Yeah, that's from the cartoons, <laughs> the good guy and the bad guy on your shoulder. Where do they get it from? It comes from the Talmud. Oh. Yeah, it comes from Jewish tradition. In fact, every Friday night, we sing a song that encourages this idea. Last night at your Sabbath tables, we all sang, Shalom Aleichem, Malachi Hashahares. The idea of the Shalom Aleichem is that when you go home from the shul on a Friday night to your house, and you arrive home, if your house is ready for Shabbat, the kids are bought and dressed, the food is cooked, all the things are switched off that needs to be switched off for Sabbath, then the one angel, the good angel, is obligated to say, may it be this way next week. But if you arrive home from shul on Friday night, and the house is a mess, it's upside down, the kids are hanging from the chandeliers, you know, <laughs> food's not even cooked, you're going to have a raw chicken, you're going to get some melena poisoning, then the evil angel is obligated to say, may it be this way next week. That's a Talmudic teaching, right? So there's the idea of the two angels, uh, the good angel and the bad angel. Also, it sounds similar to uh, the writings of John, with these light and dark metaphors. He also spoke about light and dark, remember, in the beginning of the book of John. Um, for example, he says, The light is among you, uh, while, sorry, that's what Yeshua was speaking through John, eh? Uh, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. Very mystical. That uh, John liked to make things more mystical than the rest of the Gospels for us. So um, it's, just, it's very similar to what's happening here in the story of, uh, or the, well, the version of the Epistle of Barnabas. Now, the Testament of Asher states that there are two ways of good and evil, and with these are the two inclinations. Another very famous teaching in Judaism. What are our two inclinations? The Yetzer Hara and the Yetzer Hatov. Your good inclination and your evil inclination. Okay, so... It goes on to say, now the way of life is this. First, you shall love God who made you. Sound familiar? Why does it sound familiar? Yeah? Is that what it says in the Shema? No. Ah. Yeah, it's different, eh? So it's, it's, you, you can hear it ringing the bells of what Yeshua said. These are the two greatest commandments. You shall love the Lord your God. And the second one is to love your neighbor as yourself. But the language here is different. The Derecha says, you shall love God who made you. It doesn't say you shall love the Lord your God. Now, there's a reason for this. The text of the Derecha is very careful in how it structures, who it addresses, and the language that we use. Especially when we get to the prayers. When we get to the prayers in, well, I can't remember what chapter it was, it was 11, I think, 10 and 11, where it teaches us about the prayers before and after eating, over there already, it already changes some of the traditional blessings we have in Judaism, so that it's applicable to the Gentile. So this is something that was happening in the back of the mind of the Didachas, if we can call him that, the, the people that authored the Didache, that the way that you address God as a Gentile is going to be different to the way that a Jew does it. 
Because when a Jew does a blessing, very often we start off with a blessing saying, Blessed be the Lord of God, who brought us out of Egypt. Can an Egyptian say that blessing? No. no. It's a problem, right? So that's why they decided, okay, we're going to do this little change over here as well. So, you guys all recognize this from the Ve'ahavta. Okay, so... Um, Notice that the Dedeche does not include the words, Hero Israel, the Lord of God, the Lord is one. Neither. Uh, instead, uh, it says, Blessed is the Lord God who made you. It's much more universal language. Broader application than within the narrow confines of Jewish covenantal language. So you'll find this a lot as well. Um, there's a, a bunch of guys that put together a Siddur specifically for Noahides. You can actually download it. The Noahide Siddur. And in the Noahide Siddur, they also struggled with this exact same thing. They were like, okay, well, what do we have to do with all these blessings? We have to change all of them. So over there as well, they've also changed all the blessings. I believe that they, however, if I remember correctly, I looked at it years ago. Um, instead of saying our father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they just said our father Abraham, even for Noahides as well, because of the idea that they're coming into you know, a monotheistic faith. They're also considered as sons of Abraham. But you can see the same thing happening here in the Dereche as well. It, it recognizes and understands the spiritual rights that Israel has and, and where they are separate. You know, it, still, it doesn't blur the line between Jews and Gentiles. It still kept that line even in its language that it used. Now, the Epistle of Barnabas expands the Dereche's words with a more mystical treatment, albeit in a Jewish manner. Listen to this. It says, The way of light is this. If anyone intends to journey to the appointed place... He must hurry to arrive there through his deeds. Therefore, the knowledge given us in which to walk is this. You shall love the one who made you. Why would he say love the one who made you? Because we're coming out of a polytheistic faith, right? We believed in many gods. Now we have to say Echad. So he's actually giving a little bit of a hint to the Shema. That the Jews say the Shema... Because it was like a law that God said to them, this shall be your decree as Judaism. So he was pointing towards that in the Epistle of Barnabas as well. You shall revere the one who formed you, and you shall give glory to the one who ransomed you from death. Um, let me just read to you a footnote here. The Epistle of Barnabas combines both the fear and the love of God as comprising of the way of light. Now, the Alter Rebbe of Chabad, uh, he describes fear and love as the two wings of a bird that enable one to serve God properly and allow one's study and practice of Torah and commandments to soar on high. Okay, that was an extra thing. I don't know why I read that. Anyway, let's carry on. So, verse 2. Second is, you shall love... Do you guys want to say something about that, by the way? Any questions? You understand? You see what's going on here. John? I was just thinking, you know, this uh, thing that about Gentiles that Noah is struggling with, and uh, this chapter seems to be the same as well. You know, the Apostle Paul talked about being grafted into the commonwealth of Israel, right? So if we say we are children of Abraham, okay, so that's from the perspective of one of you, right? But we believe in the God of Israel, right? And uh, um, so our ethical foundation is actually from the Torah, right? And if we look at that, I mean, that is Abraham. Isaac and Jacob. Mm. So, uh, from the ethical perspective, uh, we can also say, you know, the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, yes. from that perspective. Mm. Mm. From the ethical perspective, yes, 100%. In fact, um, uh, was it uh, this week's parasha? Yeah, I think it's this week's parasha, where uh, it talks about, it's this week or last week, where it talks about Aaron's sons, but it calls them Moses' sons. And I say, just wonder, what's going on here? And they say, if you are a teacher and you teach someone about Hashem or the laws of Hashem, it's as if you have been a father unto them. So in that sense, then you can also say, yes, ethically, anyone who follows these things is a son of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, were Aaron's sons sons of Moses? No. The Torah gives us laws that separate them from Moses' sons, right? So the Kohenim, there's still the practical, um, the practical literal lineages and the ethical, uh, ethically, 100%, we can say that. And therefore, even in the prayer that you say, right, you can also say those prayers, even though we are not ethnically Jewish. Yeah. We can say those prayers, because we are saying those prayers, when we say we, we are talking about the commonwealth of Israel. Oh, that's a good point. That's a good point, because the prayers are all in the plural. Yeah. That's actually something to think about, because, you know, the, the, the opposite argument 
is also valid that you know we need to be careful that we don't blur the lines, especially in a worship service, because the way that Hashem sent up the temple, the temple, what happens if you do this here, and the temple gets rebuilt tomorrow, and all of a sudden everyone wants to go there and pray these prayers in the temple, but you can't stand in the same place because they've separated all of us because of our ethnicities. That's another thing we have to worry about, hey. Yeah, we leave that to the side to sort out. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> That's the what get out of jail free card. <laughs> Do you want to continue on that? Yeah, I mean, um, so, like, uh, if you look at the Dilat Day, I mean, even the principles there, the Baptist and the Catholic Church, they have a lot of things that are going on. You find that, um, as uh, uh, even if they didn't have the Dilat Day, these are the foundational principles that you find even in the Catholic Church, in the Orthodox Church, in the Orthodox Church. Almost everything that they say, they let you have, right? And um, uh, in, in terms of the prayers as well, uh, in the prayers, there's a section where, where they say, um, you know, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right? And so these are mostly Gentiles yeah. who are also declared the Jews. So if you build upon those foundations, um, they didn't really have that confusion of can you say or can you not say? Mm. The Dirkei seems to make a change there. So maybe, you know, if we're saying that the Dirkei comes from the Apostles, then maybe we should use that. Maybe. Maybe we should use that in our way that we do the prayer services today. So I know, for example, you know these, uh, these brown books that we use for the blessing after eating? Um, the version that Fisher Design put together before this version, they had separate things specifically. Uh, the, if it doesn't apply to you, they would put it in brackets so that someone who it doesn't apply to doesn't say it. I mean, for example, in the Siddur, uh, with the morning of the blessings, there's a blessing that says, Blessed your Lord who has not made me a woman. Mm -hmm. So at the bottom of that, we have a version for women as well. Mm -hmm. right? So th th they also you know, uh, supply an alternative. And uh, it'll be interesting to see because the, the versions we have today, they didn't do that. These brown books we have today, they didn't do that. They took it out. So I don't know if they maybe had a change of how they're going to do it. It'll be interesting to see when they bring out their sudur at the end of this year, what they decided to do. I'd love to know. Mm. So I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, like from a Jewish perspective, right, they, uh, they'd be really careful. Okay? But if you're a Gentile that was drafted into the Commonwealth of Israel, uh, in the early days, uh, they might have been some wondering as to uh, <laughs> what formula should we use there. And uh, in, the, uh, in that comment where you said that, there might have been some sections of the Didache that preceded the Gospel. Yeah, say again? Right? There might be some sections of the... Oh, that preceded the Gospel, yeah, yeah. That preceded the Gospel. It might also be possible that there might be some sections there uh, that might have uh, preceded Paul's letters. Yeah, yeah. You know, where um, uh, he really firmed up that doctrine about the Commonwealth of Israel yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. what he was trying to do. Yeah. yeah. So once you say that you're drafted in, then a lot of this computation then begins to disappear. Mm. Right? So we might have very ancient terminology, but uh, it was pronounced uh, before the Apostle Paul reconciled it. I understand, yeah, yeah. That's actually a very interesting thing because how it was used is when it was written with if they used Paul's writings or not is vital to understanding anything Gentile related. Eh? Yeah. And that's why it's so interesting that it's in the Epistle of Barnabas, the two way section as well. Because he was doing it before Paul came around. I'm just thinking to tie in with what John said. I mean if it, the Ger, if he's been graft, grafted into Israel, I mean it's no longer a Ger, isn't it? I mean part of the Commonwealth of Israel. And then um, <clears throat> Isaiah 56 verse 3 says, Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord, To the eunuchs who keep my service and choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give him an everlasting name, which will not be cut off. Also the foreigners should join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants. Everyone who keeps from profaning the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, even those I will bring to my holy mountain, 
and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar, for, that, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all the people. Um, you get up. Not a girl anymore, you get geared up. Geared up. <laughs> <laughs> his name is Gert, he's got Gert in his name, eh? Um, and uh, I think it is, um, is it Mark 11? That's a very fast speed. Mark 11. Um, so yeah, where the Lord began to teach him and saying, Is it not written, My house shall be called the house of prayer for all the nations? Yeah. But you have made it the robber's day. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, I mean, it almost looks as if, I mean, it doesn't mean you become Jewish, but I mean, that distinction is sort of, uh, the way I read these texts, it's clear. Yeah. Okay, I see what you mean, yeah. Yeah, so I don't think the Dedeche is trying to say that um, Gentiles shouldn't be praying or anything like that, yeah. Um, you know, that, that idea of them praying towards the house of Hashem already came when Solomon built the temple, eh? And already then Solomon said, the whole point of the temple is so that all the world can pray towards this place. That's the whole point of Zakot, where we have to do the 70 offerings for all nations. It is still 100%. The, the service that Israel does in the temple does not apply only to Israel. It applies to the whole world, to all humanity. Yeah, 100%. I don't think the Dereche is saying that at all. Right. So, remember, because, uh, people are really interested in these commonwealth and the book. I think I bought it from you, actually, mm. called Crafted In. Mm which actually talks about all these dynamics. What does it mean to be grafted in part of the commonwealth of Israel, but not part of the legal identity of Israel? 100%. And yeah. what does it mean, etc., etc. Mm. So, if you're interested... Yeah. Book, so... So the Dedeche, I don't think it at all... Remember, the whole point of the Dedeche is it's a, a, a book written to the Gentiles who are coming into the Jewish circles, practicing Judaism, praying along with us, how the community is going to function, etc., etc. So I don't think it's specifically trying to make that distinction for that sake. Uh, but what we see the Dedeche itself doing is changing the language, like it does over here, of Yeshua's commandment for the Gentiles. The Dedeche, the, the author of the Dedeche, is doing that. That's what he seems to be doing. Okay. So, let's move on to the second one. You shall love your fellow as yourself. Now, Jewish law defines your fellow, your neighbor, your rea, as one's fellow Jew. So you're supposed to love your fellow Jew as yourself is a traditional understanding of this commandment. Yeshua addressed this interpretation with a parable of the Good Samaritan, where he broadened the definition of one's fellow as one's fellow human being, regardless of a person's ethnic or religious background. Right? This is probably why um, the Dedeche wants to make emphasis on this thing and talk so much about it here in this, very, uh, in this verse. Because it goes beyond just your fellow Jew or your fellow believer. This goes to even your enemy. Right, the Samaritans, did the Jews like the Samaritans? They were our enemies, we hated them. We had a big issue with them. Then when we would go to our temple to celebrate our festivals, along the way on our uh, pilgrimage up to Jerusalem, they would kill us. It happened many times during the first and second century. Well, first, no, no, not first and second century. Uh, in, the, in the times of the apostles, uh, just before them, um, that they would kill us. So we hated the Samaritans. Yeah, Yeshua gives us a parable saying, you shall love even the Samaritan, when they asked him, who is our neighbor? He says, even your enemy is who you're supposed to love. The Apostle Paul also identified the commandment as the summary of all the commandments and taught that the whole Torah is summarized in this one injunction. James, the brother of Master, declared this to be called the royal mitzvah, or the royal Torah, the royal law, is that you should love your neighbor. So it says, whatever you do not want to happen to you, do not do to one another. So this is going to be expounded a bit more in chapter 2, so we'll get to that more when we get there. But I just want to read here. It says, in this way, the Dedeche organizes legislation into categories of positive commandments and negative commandments. Listen to this. The positive commandments in chapter 1 fall under the category of the you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the negative commandments, which we'll learn about in chapter 2, fall under the category of whatever you do not want to happen to you. Do not do to one another. Just like traditional halakha in Judaism. In Judaism, we've got 613 laws. Some of them are positive. Some of them are negative. What happens when two of them have an issue with each other? When you keep the positive one. right? So even the Ten Commandments. right? You've got the positives and you've got the negatives this side. It is all the low, 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 low. You see how low it is here? You should actually have made it lower than the other one. But on the left hand side is more positive ones, right? Remember the Sabbath, etc. etc. And then there's a you shall not, you shall not, you shall not. So the Dirichai also has that kind of thing going on here. Right. Now uh, it says this is the teaching about these matters. Oh, sorry, this is now number three. Let's read verse three of the Dirichai, chapter one. It says This is the teaching about these matters. Speak well of those who speak ill of you. 
Pray for your enemies. Fast for those who persecute you. For what special favor do you merit if you love those who love you? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? We'll discuss that in a moment. However, you are to love those who hate you, and you will not have any enemies. Okay. So, um, it says here, speak well of those who speak ill of you. What do you guys think about that? <laughs> we like to win fights, don't we? Eh, we like to get the last word in an argument about someone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's far, yeah. It's the place where we do the most talking, we 100 percent Or should I say the most most shouting? Oh. Yeah. yeah, keep quiet, you're not married. Uh, so, <laughs> no, <I'm joking>. <laughs> <laughs> There's certain things that you only learn. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go under your hoodie, go under the chupa. Okay. Selective, yes. Tell my, tell, my, tell my future wife to meet Yeah. If you, know, if you know where she is. I don't know. It's fine. We'll teach you the lessons along. There's a difference, there's a difference between hearing and listening. <laughs> yes, dear. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so the content of the saying sounds familiar to Yeshua's words in Luke chapter 6, where he says, You shall bless those who curse you. Yo, that's a difficult one, eh? Yeah. Wow. Yeshua included not only Gentiles, but also enemies in the Torah's definition of the word fellow. So when he spoke about this, the reason why he chose this Samaritan specifically, because they were our enemies. Uh, now, in the context of the Gospels, where Yeshua said that, the enemies of Yeshua's disciples would have been primarily the Roman idolaters, Jewish apostates, and sectarians such as the Sadducees. But in the context of the Didache, the enemies of the Gentile disciples would more likely have been the Roman authorities, or perhaps even your family members or friends who did not accept your new religious Convictions. That doesn't change. Exactly the same today. What is every year when Christmas comes around, you guys end up wondering. You want to dodge the bullets. <laughs> dodge the bullets, yeah. Or Easter, even you know, should my children go do the Easter egg hunt with my pagan brother? It's it's one of the problems we have still till this day, hey. Isn't it actually crazy? Yeah, we actually have the exact same problems they had that time. When I mean, you were thinking normal Christianity, you don't have those problems anymore. No, no, you don't. Yeah, because because <laughs> everyone's gone pagan. Yeah. <laughs> Pagans are us. No. It's amazing. <laughs> so the Dirichai is telling you what to do. You should love your family that you hate so much. I don't know how many of you guys ever had these fights with your families when you guys became messianic. Ooh. Many people have told me, yeah, I dubbed two hands in the air somewhere. No, both sides of the family. <laughs> you still have these fights with your families. Here's our instruction from the master. The Dirichai is saying to you, hey? You're going you're gonna to go fight this afternoon. No, you're not, because now you're going to listen to what Yeshua says. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, jeez, Andre, <laughs> you invited your whole old church to come to the shul today, fantastic, it's a good thing I wasn't preaching, <laughs> the new Gentile believers in Messiah dealt with the consequences of accepting a monotheistic faith in a completely polytheistic idolatrous world, can you imagine what those guys went through, you think you've got it difficult, the people you're fighting with your family are monotheistic, these guys are saying, how dare you spit in the face of Thor? <laughs> and all these weird yeah, other gods and stuff. And the there you go, exactly. And it's all your fault. It's all your fault. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. So, uh, it was not easy for them to break with paganism. And they paid in social consequences and outright persecution. The Didache urges them not to become bitter, but instead to walk in sacrificial love. Did you hear that? Anger and retaliation would not end the persecution, nor bring others to the Messiah. However, acting completely opposite to expectation, that would testify to God's love. We need to change the way we see it, guys. I remember once upon a time I saw like a little meme that someone sent out, one of these uh, Hebrew roots memes things that said, Torah makes strangers family and family strangers. <laughs> it's true, but it's not good. It's not good. What? We're supposed to love even our enemies, Yeshua says. So it's something that we've created and we've, you know, to, to explain our situation, but without having the heart of the understanding of what we're supposed to be doing. It's sad that we've done that. And we do this in many different sections of religion. All of us do this, still today. Our family will be even able to become strangers because they don't share with us this life anymore. There, there is a sort of... It's, yeah. it's not strange that we don't love them anymore. Obviously, if they need something, if they press our buttons, we'll be there for them and we mm. treat them with kindness and respect. But yeah. There is a sort of alienization that does happen, not because of we, just we, we come, we here, we, we coming together here. Well, 
Facebook. I mean, we can join them. And yeah. I do. Yeah. Well, we do. Uh, I think Yeshua alludes to a very similar thing. Yeah. You know, who are yes. my mother and my brother? Yes, I was thinking that exactly. You know, there's a worse version there. It's not just blood. Yeah. You know, it yeah. goes deeper than that. And yeah. I think that's maybe what that's touching on is that you even find people who believe mm. that actually becomes more family yeah. mm. than blood. Spiritual family, yeah. But I agree. It shouldn't alienate you. Yeah, here's the thing. If if someone who's a pagan idolater has better manners than you as a disciple of Yeshua, where he won't hate you because of yeah. your different thing, then you're doing something wrong. I, I think that happens a lot. Hey? But Yeshua at one point he even says you'll have to end up hating your own brother or mother more than <laughs> and to love me more than them, eh? Very often they're willing to compromise what they believe to mm. come and join you at yeah. your they are. Hanukkah or whatever. Yeah. Are we willing to make space for them? No, we're not. And that's, I think, what also very often drives yeah. the problem. But I think for, but it was also for me, um, I felt like I was betraying God by going to yeah. a pagan festival. Like mm. I did not want to, still don't want to go to Christmas, but you have this this conflict of do I do it to show them I love them or do I love God more and therefore mm. I won't join in a pagan festival. I yeah, I think our mindset puts the two in antithesis rather than realizing that these are the two greatest commandments, loving God and your neighbor. They're supposed to be on the same level. Mm-hmm. Where uh, Even to the point, I mean, this week's parasha, okay, uh, the, this week's parasha, for example, yeah, the yellow one. Yeah. Um, uh, where was I going with this now before I was interrupted? Um, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, oh yeah, with the idea that Stephen shared with us about the fact that God would let his own name be erased for the sake of peace between a couple shows us that even God sees loving your neighbor as more important than loving God. That's why Yeshua teaches us, before you can come to the temple and bring your offering, if you've got an issue with your brother, put that offering down right there and go fix that first before you come to me. So I think you, you, But that also doesn't mean do something wrong yeah. for the sake of a relationship. Yeah. So go to the Christmas party, but... Instead of eating the pork on the table, just take the apple out of its mouth and eat the apple. Problem solved. Yeah, John. Yeah. I can see your. I can see your wife isn't here. <laughs> Back then, yeah, yeah. Uh, especially if the person is in the <laughs> Yeah. You know, they'd be saying the same prayer, <laughs> right? Um, I guess that they wouldn't really be conflicted about, you know, some of those prayers with uh, can God of our ancestors and so on like this. They wouldn't be conflicted. Now, here, uh, I think what the dinner takes is actually deeper than just, you know, you don't assume the identity of the people. Right. Mm-hmm. So even if you say those prayers, you know, you're talking about the one God. Yeah. Uh, uh, in your mind, you're looking at it from an ethical perspective or from where we derive our heritage, the core of our teachings. Mm-hmm. So you can say that with confidence, but you should not substitute the two people. So that's why it makes that distinction there. In terms, of, it's not necessarily what you're praying, right? I was wondering this morning when Stephen was leading us in the prayers about my ancestors and the God of my fathers, and I thought to myself, well, technically, his ancestors all believed in one God, the same God as well. Not just Andre, he's still alive, and his grandparents, but his grand- great-grandparents as well. They believed in Hashem. They didn't believe in other gods, so to him it was his ancestors as well. Well, interesting. Abraham is our ancestor, technically, both. Yeah. I'm not talking about that, I'm talking about literally now. <laughs> Just out of, you know, oh, it's one second, that old dichotomy. Yeah. Okay, anyway, let's carry on. Uh, so it goes on to say, you should pray for your enemies. When else do you do that? Pray for them to see the light. Yeah, pray for them to see the light. Also, enemies are enemies. You know, if God gives you instruction, go there and destroy your enemy. You pray for them and you still destroy them. But you've but you got to pray for them. This is why we've got that concept that you're not allowed to celebrate at the death of your enemy. 
Remember with Pesach, the seventh day of Pesach, we celebrate the crossing of the, the sea. And uh, instead of doing the full halal, which is that joyful, ay, 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 we only do the half halal because it's on that day that the majority of Egypt died. Uh, and that um, so many what, thousands of God's creation died on that day. Because you're not allowed to rejoice at the death of your enemies. Even Hamas. Yeah, when, yeah. So what Hamas does is, as soon as they kill a Jew, what do they do? They go out into the streets and hand out sweets yeah. and stuff. Say, we We're not allowed to do that. Thing. No, we rejoice in returning. Like, hey, they killed their leader, and yay, you know what? It's like, yeah. Enemy, yeah. But... We make a few funny memes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, did you see the one about the Iranian guy that got killed? He must died in a helicopter crash. Yes, yeah. So they made a meme about saying it's a secret agent from the IDF named Eli Copter. <laughs> And this meme went around very quickly, like wildfire, and eventually it made it onto the French news and into Al Jazeera. They thought it was legit. That there was an actual guy called Eli Copter that was in the IDF or the Mossad agent. <laughs> so you're not allowed to rejoice overtly yeah. in that. You know, we're not supposed to, you know, we've got to see the bigger picture. The idea of, you know, you think about how so many wars begin, it's just pure arrogance of the leaders of the countries. They're just arrogant. Why do we need to kill so many people in order if you get a little piece of land? Stuff like, why? It's arrogance. Because they don't see the bigger picture that we were all created by the same God. You and your enemy were created with the same divine breath. When you see someone, you should not see the physical person they are or that guy that makes you so angry. You should see the spirit of God in them. That's what Yeshua came to teach us. It's beyond the letter of the law. That's difficult. It's difficult. But this is the Torah of Messiah. This is what we're supposed to be training ourselves to. This is righteousness. <laughs> it's difficult. Yeah, John? Thinking again? Thinking again? I think it's said that um, if you're humiliated, right, at the point of the end humiliation, where you're completely embarrassed or uh, you know, people have said all kinds of things about you, at that point, uh, any prayer that you make is especially efficacious. Mm, straight to the heaven. <laughs> so imagine, I suppose that you're saying as well, you know, you're standing there and someone comes along and says, I curse you, my goodness, of that. And as you're uh, being subject to all of these curses, probably your prayer is very efficacious. And if at that point you say that you pray for your enemies, that would be a very effective prayer. Wow. And think about Yeshua on the cross. Yeah. <laughs> Forgive them for they know not what they do. And that's what happened. Through his death, all of mankind can be forgiven. Wow. That's intense. And Yeshua told us as his disciples, we should be just like that. Expect the same, that they'll kill us too. For the same thing, we should pray for them as they kill us. Ah, John, um, not you, his brother, um, James, sorry, James. James. James did the same thing, remember when he was being killed as well. well we started that in the study of Acts, as they were hitting him with a footer's club. He was praying for them as they were clapping him in the face. That's, oh, wow, it's amazing. All right, so pray for your enemies, guys. The saying is reminiscent of the Master's word that says, pray for those who persecute you. And pray for those who abuse you. That's a strange one. Eh? The Talmud tells the story of Rabbi Meir as he lived near bandits who constantly troubled him. In desperation, he prayed that these bandits would die. In with his tzotzis. His wife, Bruria, said to him, What makes you think that a prayer like that is permissible? Instead, you should be praying for them that they will repent. And then there will be no more wickedness. So Rabbi Meir prayed for them. And they eventually repented and became his disciples. Story of Paul. Paul was there killing us as believers, as followers of Messiah. And eventually he became the most important of the apostles because we've got most of his writings today. As a disciple of the Master, we must first and foremost look at everyone as created in the image of God and as fellow human beings. Praying for our enemies helps remove our anger and negative emotions and at the same time helps us focus on the perpetrator as the one who is truly in need of God. It changes you in a positive sense if you pray for them rather than festering that anger and that hatred in you. That's not going to help you at all. I know it's hard, but it is the way of life. Listen to this one. <laughs> fast for those who persecute you. I don't even fast for myself. He wants me to <laughs> fast for those who persecute you. Wow. The version of the saying that Derechei likely reflects an authentic oral tradition of Yeshua's words that are not actually found in our synoptic gospels. Fasting for our enemies causes, uh, causes the one being wronged to take a compassionate look at the perpetrator and to see their broken soul. You know the effectiveness of fasting as well. If you really want someone to change their ways to stop terrorizing you, try and fast for them. Shoo, that's difficult, eh? Who in their right mind would do something like that? 
people whose focus is not on this world, but is on the kingdom of God, who wants to see every soul purified and make it into the world to come. Sure. Sounds like the prick of it, almost. All right. Uh, it goes on to say, For what special favor do you merit if you love those who love you? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? So this sounds familiar, of course, because this is a quote from the Gospels. Mm -hmm. Yeshua says this in Matthew 5, If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Now, the rabbis refer to obtaining merit or favor with God as the word zechut. Uh, zechut is defined as favorable judgment or an acquittal or merit. But in rabbinic literature, it came to be applied to the protecting influence of freely chosen good conduct over and above what was required by the law. The master asked his disciples to go beyond the letter of the law of the Torah and to perform acts of zechut, the special merit, in line with the spirit of the Torah. This concept is deeply embedded in the gospel message. John the Baptist began his ministry by giving instructions in zechut to those wanting to repent. He said, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. In Luke chapter 3, verse 11, uh, Zacchaeus performed an act of zechut by going above and beyond what the Torah required for restitution. We'll get to the Gentile thing in a minute. That's what you want to ask, right? Yeah. Uh, and in turn, the master told Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to this house. Remember that story of Zacchaeus. The Torah gives a specific amount you're supposed to give back, I think, five times or something, or three times, depending on how much you took or whatever. He gave back multiple more than what he was supposed to require by the Torah. And that is called zechut. He got special merit for going above and beyond the minimum requirements. Okay, that's, by the way, the definition of what a chassid is. A chassid is someone who goes beyond the letter of the law. Now, Cornelius, for example, um, who... When we talk about Cornelius, he should actually be the most important person in the Bible, New Testament, to Gentiles. He was the first one that the Holy Spirit fell on, right? The first Gentile. Mm -hmm. So you have to look at him and see, if you want the prototype of what first century believer in Yeshua, Gentile, looked like, this is the guy, Cornelius. He merited the visitation of an angel who told him, your prayers, the prayers that he was praying, and your alms, your donations, because remember he was donating to the local synagogue, have ascended as a memorial before God. His alms and his prayers were an act of zechut before the Lord. Uh, the Apostle Peter writes, What credit, what zechut is it, if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. That's building up zechut once again. Things that you know, It's not about deserving it or just doing the minimum because you were told to do it. It's going beyond the letter of the law. In the original context of the Master's saying, Yeshua used the term Gentiles here in antithesis to his Jewish disciples. So he said, don't the Gentiles do the same? They greet each other with a smile. Remember, he was speaking to his Jewish disciples. In the same way, when the word appears in the context of the Didache, it must be understood to refer to idolaters who have not yet accepted the God of Israel. Remember, the Greek word is one of those things we don't have two different words. So we should actually look at the context. Every time you see the word Gentiles, you must look at the context and see, is it talking about the Gentiles or is it talking about pagans? Unfortunately, the word is the same. And that's, uh, I think it bothers a lot of people. The translation of says heathens. Not heathens, there we go. Not yeah. there we go. In the New Testament, we find the Greek term ethnos, mm -hmm. usually translated as Gentiles, used both as a designation for heathens and as a term for non-Jews who have come to know the Messiah. That's very confusing. So what's the solution? Use Hebrew, not Greek. The Dirichay's point in, it is, uh, uh, in its use of the word is that even idolaters are kind to their friends. Tommy, Tommy, right? I rub your back, you rub mine. True piety calls for a higher standard. So every time you guys see the word Gentiles, you've got to look at the context to understand it. And don't get offended by it, please. It's literally just a semantic thing. Okay. All right, so we move on from uh, praying and loving our enemies. <laughs> However, it says... You are to love those who hate you, and you will not have any enemies. Once again, very, very difficult. Um, who was Israel's biggest enemy in history? Before in history, before, even before the Germans, greater than the Germans. Amalek. Yeah? Amalek. Amalek. Yeah. Before Amalek. Philistines. Philistines. They were pretty dodgy as well. Amman. Amman was dodgy. Hey. Eh? Yeah, no, sorry, they were before, sorry, yeah, right, that was with old David and them. Babylonians, we went into exile, we actually had all of them, all of the above are enemies of Israel. <laughs> Strange, eh? But you said before Amalek. Yeah. The Egyptians. 
The Egyptians are like the source of hatred for Jews, actually. Now, what does the Torah say? How should we treat the Egyptians? The young ones into the, the river. They killed all of our kids as well. We were enslaved by them. The Apostolic Constitutions provide scriptural support for the saying, Do not hate any man, not an Egyptian, nor an Edomite, for they are all workmanship of God. There's a commandment in the Torah that says, Even with the Egyptians, we shall not hate the Egyptians. The guys that we grew up under for slavery for what, how many years was it? 110, 230 years that we were under them. Do not hate the Egyptian. And this commandment of not hating your enemies is like a basis one for where we get the idea of do not hate, or you shall love the girl, you shall love the stranger, because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. If you were showing this kind of um, love towards a stranger, the other nations around you would see it, and there would be a standard for treating foreigners, and they would have treated you the same way in the first place. It's a very interesting way of looking at it, right? Everyone is part of the workmanship of God. Deuteronomy 23, verse 7. Mm. Uh, it then adds the word in the apostolic constitutions you shall avoid not the persons uh, but the sentiments of the wicked it's telling us hate the sin not the sinner and that's an important thing you know you don't realize this until it hits home for example let me put this to you what if uh, your child decides they're gay do you disown them throw them at the house never speak to them again no. do you hate them no. you can't it's your child Hate the sin, right? To tell them you disagree with this, etc., etc. But you can't get rid of this child and write them off for the rest of your life. What's going to happen? They're going to get depressed and they're going to go kill themselves. And then you are the reason why they committed murder. That's no good. That's not getting anyone anywhere. And this happens a lot in the community when things like that happen. So uh, that's something for us to consider as well, right? Hate the sin, not the sinner. This is especially important with kids because you when know, a child of mine does naughty stuff, ooh, ooh. do I go red in the face and want to clap his backside? And I, once I give him one hiding, I say, turn the cheek. So I can give him another one. <laughs> I'm joking, man. <laughs> I wouldn't say stuff like that while I'm being recorded. All right, so uh, the book of Proverbs instructs us, do not rejoice when your enemy falls and do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. Exodus 23 verse 4 says, uh, if we see the animal of our enemy or one who hates us, lost or fallen, what must you do? Say, ha, ah, serves you right, you punk. Nope. We must assist in the animal's rescue. Someone that hates you, you have to help his animal. In this vein, the Apostle Paul writes, If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, uh, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Okay? Not literally putting burning coals on his head. But you'll be heaping coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We are to strive to be like our master who found favor with God and with man. Why? Because love covers a multitude of sins. So you see here uh, how we started this chapter. There are two ways, the way of life and the way of death. We thought we were on the right way. Until we are doing this stuff, we're not fully on the right path just yet. And there's a great difference between the two. This is why we can say who in their right mind would do these things. There's a great difference between these two parts. Okay. Number four, verse four. Let's read verse four. All right. Uh, it says, Restrain yourselves from natural and physical inclinations. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other to him, and you will be complete. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two. If someone takes away your cloak, give him your tunic also. If someone takes away what is yours, do not demand it back, for you are not even able to get it back. It's a very ethical mitzvah as well. All right, let me try to speed this up because it's getting late. All right, Jewish teaching, as we have noted, divides human motivations into two categories, your evil inclination and your good inclination. Uh, what the master had in mind, this is what he had in mind when he said that we should pray to, for our shame to deliver us from evil. He's talking about our inclination. In fact, we pray this every morning in our Shadur. Did you know that every morning, one of the first things we do in our prayers is to get ourselves ready for this challenge of your two inclinations that are going to challenge you throughout yes, the day. Yeah. So we do this every morning. We say, lead us not into error, transgression, iniquity, temptation, or disgrace. Do not let the evil instinct dominate us. Mm. Do not let the yetzerara dominate us. Keep us far from a bad man, a bad companion, and help us attach ourselves to the good instinct, the yetzer tov, and to do good deeds. And bend our instincts to be subservient to you. Both. Does the bad inclination come from the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, right? Or is it there even before that? I think it's from there. 
I'm sure I can find you a rabbi that says it was before that, but I think it's from there. Yeah. yeah. Right. The potential was always there. The potential was always there, but it was woken up, I think. No, here's the thing. They, they must have had it before because they were tempted. So they must have had it before. And because sin came into the world with bite. It's yeah. well, part of our creation. The temptation came from external. Hey? The temptation came from external. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The temptation we face is internal. Yes. You know, it's actually our desires to do certain things. Adam mm. and Eve didn't necessarily have that desire until the snake came and said, hey, you know, mm. God says it won't be good for you, but I say, mm. yeah, it's going to be lack. But, but mm. it's like anything. You don't necessarily know that certain things can exist until you are exposed to it. Uh, here's the thing. Jewish tradition says that uh, on your bar mitzvah is the first time you get your good inclination. So according to Judaism, you're born with the evil inclination. Yes, now. Um, well, because the question that raises is that God created evil inclination. Yes, he did. Yeah. So the, uh, Judaism says uh, the Yetzer Atov is good, the Yetzer Hara is even better. If you can learn to, what's the word? You know, like these wild horses that you tame? If you can learn to control your Yetzerara, it's even more powerful than your Yetzerara Like us in the, in, in, in the Pekka book, I believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, mm, you yeah. always says the man who conquers is even connection, is even stronger. Yes. Than yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's only when we nullify our own eagles and lower our esteem of ourselves that we will be able to overlook the wrongs that we have done to uh, that have been done to us and turn the other cheek to those around us. It says, if someone strikes you on the right cheek, you should turn the left to him and you will be complete. Have you guys watched the UFC fighting? No. <laughs> How many of us would do this? Have you ever done this before? Anyone ever attacked you and you just said, mm, I'm not going to fight back? I tried it once. Uh, I was in high school. And there was this real mukhu that used to fight every two weeks with someone. One day he came and he punched me in the back. And I just turned around and looked at him and was like, what? And I just walked away. And then he didn't know what to do. He was expecting me to hit him back. He didn't know what to do. So he just walked away. But no, that was fantastic. I couldn't do anything. They had guns. <laughs> yeah, that's a different problem, that. <laughs> South Africa, we have to live with self-defense. Okay, we come now to the first of four sayings dealing with the spe- specifics of showing love to an enemy. Each of them illustrate the rabbinic concept of going beyond the letter of the law. Is it literal that we should turn the other cheek when someone attacks us? It should be noted that Yeshua himself did not literally turn the other cheek when he was struck by an officer of the high priest, but instead he demanded justification, justification from his strikers. Sure, he didn't fight back. But he didn't just turn the other cheek and accept it. It seems best to read turn the other cheek passages as a hyperbolic sayings about not seeking revenge when one has been wronged. When disciples take on the posture of non-retaliation, they directly imitate the Messiah. Uh, For example, it says in Isaiah 50 verse 6, I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. So even Isaiah is talking about that. This sounds like me holding Mordechai for five minutes. He's pulling out my beard and hitting me everywhere. Despite being persecuted and abused, the disciples of the Master is not to seek revenge. Why do we not seek revenge? Vengeance belongs to Hashem. And this is the thing that we need to try to teach our kids while they're still young. eh? Because when you're young, you always want revenge. Especially if there's brothers in the household. eh? You took my toy. Hey, but you can't clap him because he took your toy. Vengeance is not yours. Vengeance is Hashem. If we can ingrain it into our children, they won't have problems like we have today. Yes. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two. Instead of complaining, a follower of the Yeshua uh, was to acquiesce without protest and perform even more than was expected. You go two miles instead of one. This act of total love and submission would send a tremendous message about the character of the God of Israel. It says, if someone takes away your cloak, give him your tunic also. Does this encourage thievery? No. No. The context of the saying is that of litigation. In a court of law, the creditor could quite literally demand the shirt off of a debtor's back. Now, the Torah forbids creditors from seizing a man's cloak, and the book of Amos, for example, chastises those who transgress that prohibition. The Dedekai instructs us to demonstrate our good faith by voluntarily setting aside your own rights. How's that? How many times do we feel entitled to something? It's my right to have this. The Dedekai is teaching us to voluntarily set aside your rights. This would surely merit favor with God. For the sages say that the Holy One, blessed is He, loves the one who does not insist on His full rights. Check that, Pesachim 113b. 
The Apostle Paul told the mixed Jewish Gentile community of Corinth the same thing, that they should avoid going to the court and instead settle their disputes within the body of believers and before a court of congregational elders. We're going to discuss that a bit later in the Didache as well, about this idea that every congregation had to have like their own Beit Din or their own elders that would um, uh, be like a court of law. Which is if someone... Steal something from you, just say, give it back. Yeah, could. just give it back, yeah. Exactly, instead of making them go to jail for it, well, etc. it seems to be like, well... Oh, this actually says... Steal more. <laughs> steal more. <laughs> you took 10 rand, would you like another 10 <laughs> No. <laughs> listen, yeah, listen, yeah. But give me back my 10 rand and I'll donate 20 rand to you. I think that'll be a better way of doing it, right? If someone takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. For you are not even able to get it back. This is confusing. Such behavior is reminiscent of per vote of the one who says what is mine is yours and what's yours is yours. That's a pious person, right? Historical circumstances from around the time of the writing of the Didache may help shed some light on the meaning of the same. At the time of the Roman Emperor Domitian was strictly enforcing a tax called Fiscus Judaicus. What is Fiscus Judaicus? It's not a Jewish fish. It's a Jewish tax. Every Jewish person in the Roman Empire was required to pay an annual poll tax of two drachmas. The authorities did not distinguish between those who were legally Jewish and people who merely practice aspects of Judaism. So a lot of God-fearers ended up having to pay the Jewish tax as well, simply because they were Sabbath keepers, because they were eating kosher, because they were followers of Yeshua as well, interestingly enough. The Roman historian Suetonius writes about the arrest and prosecution of Gentiles who did not publicly acknowledge the Jewish faith, but still lived as Jews. They were thrown in the same basket. The Didache admonishes its readers to accept these chastisements and to not retaliate. After all, they were not even able to fight against the Roman government. Instead, once again, they were to rely on their father in heaven, who would plead their cause and rob of life those who rob them. In other words, refraining from retaliation is part of the way of discipleship to the master and reflects the order of the messianic era. Once again, it's difficult for us to understand when you look at the laws of this world and you want justice the whole time. We have to go beyond just the letter of the law. A kingdom lifestyle is realizing that you own nothing anyway. How many of you have ever been cheated out of a ton of money in business dealings? I'm sure many of us have. Yeah. How did that make you feel? Emotionally? Angry. Angry. <laughs> terrible. Upset. Poor. Poor, yeah. 100%. <laughs> now, it happened to me as well once, and I never got my money back. And it lived in me, in me, and it festered in me. It made me angry. It made me not trust anyone. It made me fight with my own family as well. I was a grumpy old man until one day I realized this, this, this hatred that I've got in me is going to get me nowhere. It's going to be the death of me. I had to force myself to forgive these people that stole the money from me just so I could move on with my life. Never got that money back, but thank goodness I haven't ended up holding them at gunpoint and ending up in jail for doing something like that. It's very important for us to do this for our own sake, to realize that, you know what, the truth is, in the bigger scheme of things, one day, when you're six feet underground, nothing you owned was yours in the first place. If someone steals money from you, they're not stealing from you, they're stealing from Hashem. So, you know, that's a... So, but where did the, the, the justice side of Torah then come in when, the, when he faces situations like that? Pursue justice, 100%. Because if justice would say that, well, Torah has said commandments and how to deal with that, but mm. then this seems to say that, no, if you take something from me, we just let it go. I would say that's better. Sure, pursue justice, mm, but then you're going to be the rest of your life in the courts mm. for every single little thing. Well, we have a disciple who's not worrying about what's mine and what's yours. And some of the fights, you're not going to any case. Yeah. Uh, most fight. of the fights, and you're not going to win any. And you know that actually going into it. Exactly. So, what's the point? It's exactly what's the what point? you were saying about yeah. Mm. All it does is poison you yourself, and you are the ones that are, that are in shame. They don't care. Yeah. It's got no they don't they, care. They, yeah. They, they feel nothing. They feel nothing. They are on their way. They're going to do something else. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and that stress that's in you is going to end up causing you medical issues. Issue. It's going to cost you more with your medical. It, cost you mm. your, it can cost you your life in the long run. Exactly. Don't worry though. We've got the national health insurance thing coming. <laughs> the NHI. <laughs> By the time that thing comes in, all the doctors are in Australia. No, but I'm Oi. just trying to, to understand where do we... Does that mean more full on as a letter of the Torah and then this way, the more spirit side of it? Because yeah. I mean, that, as I said, that stuff isn't Torah. I mean, Torah is 
you know, supportive of it. Otherwise, Hashem wouldn't have given those things. But then, is he, has he said, mm. if you wanted, this is how you. But yeah, yeah. So just because yeah, the Torah, saying? just because the Torah gives us a law or a commandment, doesn't mean that it's good for you. Okay. It's giving us laws of slavery, for example. It's not saying we should pursue enslaving someone. The laws are there to protect someone. The idea of justice. So the laws of justice are there as well to protect justice. There's right and there's wrong, 100%. Okay. But there's, there's more to life than just right and wrong. I mean, you learn this when you get married. <laughs> if you have an argument and you win the argument, you've lost. <laughs> you've lost more than you've won. You've lost much more than you've won. <laughs> so it's a, it's a very complex thing, actually. But good thinking, though. Yeah, of course, justice, justice you shall no, pursue. Just, 100%. Uh, we all yeah. want to, but I'm just thinking of you mm. know, the, the heretics. Yeah. If, imagine, if so, if, imagine if an outsider is looking at us as a community of believers, Yeshua disciples, and they see us fighting with each other, taking each other to court the whole time. Yeah. They won't want anything to do with this, with this belief system of ours. All right. Uh, verse 5. We're almost at the end. Uh, it says, Give to whoever asks and do not demand it back, for the Father wants to give his own gifts to everyone. Once again, it's his gifts, it's not ours. No? Did you guys give uh, Bar Mitzvah boy a gift? Contentment awaits one who gives according to the commandment, for he is blameless. How terrible for one who takes. For anyone who has a need and takes will be blameless, but one who does not have a need uh, will give an account as to why he took it and for what purpose. And when he is put into prison, he will be questioned thoroughly about what he has done, and he will not get out from there until he has paid the last penny. Okay, so at first glance it appears that Dirichayin joins us to give anything to anyone who asks for it. Have you had these guys that come up to your door and you give them something and they say, no, I don't want that, I want something else. I want money, I don't want food. <laughs> However, the Greek word here for asks is the word aieto, it- it- uh, can be used in the sense of borrowing though. Okay? So in this sense, it might be speaking about borrowing. Furthermore, the context here should remain within the scope of loving your enemy. Remember, that's the, the main heading we're studying under here. It's about loving your enemy. One should not hold back from lending to someone something as a way of exacting revenge on that person. Oh, I hate you. I'm not going to lend you something. We're spiteful as human beings. Let's be honest. We're like that. We're childish. Don't do that. You know, when someone says, remember we studied this when we learned about the laws of Tzara'at. If your neighbor asks you for uh, some salt and you, you hate that neighbor and you say, sorry, I don't have salt. You get Tzara'at on your house. So that what happens? You have to call the priest to come inspect your house. And before you can do that, you have to unpack everything in your house in the street. And then your neighbor can see you actually did have salt. You were lying in the first place. That's teaching the same lesson. For the Father wants to give his own gifts to everyone. Matthew chapter 5 verse 45 says, For the Father wants to give to everyone, uh, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. If God blesses even evildoers, who do you think you are to decide who is evil and who is not evil? In the act of giving, the disciple of the master becomes a servant of the lender, as Proverbs says, that is a manager of the divine gifts from Hashem. In essence, the Dedeche asks us to imitate God just as he has given freely to us, so should we freely give to others. Do any of us actually deserve the stuff we ask of from God? No. no. None of them. We don't deserve anything he gave to us. So if we want to go and follow this rule strictly that you know you only get this if you deserve it, we should have nothing from Hashem in the first place. In fact, we shouldn't even have bread. So who are we to decide that we know better than God? Yet Hashem still gives. He still sends blessings. Baruch Hashem. Contentment awaits one who gives according to the commandment, for he is blameless. Contentment awaits. Anyone want to guess what that word is there for Hebrew? Happy are those. It's Ashrei. It's an Ashrei statement. It's one of the Beatitude statements that Yeshua used on the Mount of Beatitude. Uh, so he says, Contentment, or happy are those who gives according to the commandment, for he is blameless, but also woe unto someone who takes. So it's the same thing. It's Ashrei and the, the woe. Um, uh, how terrible for one who takes. So uh, Paul in Acts chapter 20 verse 35 quotes Yeshua saying, It is more blessed to give than to receive. That's not in the Gospels, right? That's one of Paul's um, quotations that he heard from the oral traditions about Yeshua. It is better to give than to receive. Because you will be blameless. That's fantastic, right? The, dis- uh, the disciple who gives is blameless in regard to his stewardship over his resources. Because he gives according to the commandment. One day when your life is finished, we're going to be standing there in front of the pearly gates. And Hashem is going to call us in. And he's going to ask us, on this day, that year, you didn't give this. Why didn't you give it? And you're going to say, oh, it was a tough month that month, you know, I'm not sure if we were going to make it. Hashem's going to say, what do you mean? It wasn't yours in the first place. It's mine. My job that I gave you was to help out people 
that are in need and you had something to give to a need and you didn't give it. Can you imagine that day? We're going to have to give an accounting of every single time that has happened. I'm going to find a from that time. Yeah. Do you think Hashem is going to ask us, show us maybe on a TV screen, every time we passed a beggar in the street and didn't give him something? That's what I was going to ask now. Practically. I think we should be able, we should be giving every time. Every single time. I'd say so. Why not? Nothing belongs to us in the first place. Get to verse six. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it doesn't yeah, say yeah, give yeah, a million. Exactly. It doesn't say give. Yeah, yeah. yeah it doesn't say give a million every time. Also, there's a difference between who you should give to and who you should. Yeah, yeah. We'll get to that Not now. Not just anyone. Mm. Um, we'll get to that now. Yeah. Okay. okay. I see the the wheels are turning here, guys. <laughs> In South Africa, is a special thing to study this idea of yeah, giving tzedakah exactly. because it's every corner, and you know this guy's going to go behind that bush and smoke his glue. Mm. Well, what do you do with what Hashem gave you? You do the same. You do even worse. You take that money and you go do commit adulteries and you could do things much worse than smoking glue. I have a bag of glue. Because if you give it to someone who actually they use it for good, for godly good, then it's how do you judge that? How do you, how do you judge that? You must let your what that thing sweat in your palm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, verse six. Okay. And there's a lot about this uh, about um, uh, Messiah peddlers who take advantage of this exactly because we're supposed to be so giving it doesn't change the fact we're supposed to be giving eh? yes they take advantage of us that's not our problem that's their problem so what does verse 6 mean we'll get there in a minute alright in the context of the dead hey, verse 5 is saying that the one who receives should be warned about taking charity if he does not truly need it if he receives in need he shall not be judged however if he receives when he does not need then he shall pay a penalty. Uh, once this is made clear, the Dedeche then gives a lachic instruction for both the giver and the receiver. The rich are to give according to the commandment, and the poor are to receive only when necessary. In fact, Paul, Paul did this in the Gospels, uh, well, sorry, in the book of Acts. There was, uh, we had a whole group of um, widows that were getting funds from the community in Jerusalem. At one point, we had so many widows, we didn't know what to do anymore. Paul said to them, okay, fine, those that are young enough to find a job, take them off the list, they're not getting money anymore. Let them go get a job. Because he was re realizing that, you know, those that are in, uh, that need to receive, need to receive. But if you can do something else, you don't need to receive. You're going to be guilty of this, of taking when you don't need to receive. When someone receives alms under false pretenses, he will be punished as a debtor who has defaulted on a loan. Thrown into a Roman debtor's prison and not released until he has paid the debt. The sages believe that one who received charity but did not need it would be punished by actually becoming needy themselves. Listen to this. Our rabbis taught, if a man pretends to have a blind eye or a swollen belly, I'm not pretending, mine is literally like that, <laughs> or a shrunken leg. We've all heard stories of the beggars faking their injuries and stuff, right? He will not pass out from this world before it actually happens upon him. He will have that condition. So beware of this actor's <laughs> Where's Nati? We need him. <laughs> He's an actor. <laughs> that happens with the movies as well. Guys that act certain roles, they eventually become like those roles as well. You know, they go insane if they act like someone who's insane. <laughs> if a man accepts charity and is not in need of it, his end will be that that he will pa not pass out of this world before he comes to such a condition itself. That'll scare you off, eh? Okay. So uh, let's get to this is number six. Let me read it in full, though. It says. But regarding this, it has also been said, let your donation sweat in your hands until you know to whom to give it. Okay, so I'll ask you what it means, and I think the general understanding is, yeah, you must be careful of who you give your money to, right? That seems to be the context of what uh, that's saying, but what is the true context of what we're discussing here? The context that we're discussing this Mishnah or this verse in is that we're supposed to be giving without expecting in return, right? It says, Ashrei, let your donations sweat in your hands. Um, it seems to indicate an eagerness to give. It may be similar to the modern English expression of burning a hole in your pocket, rather than don't give to anyone. There's a different way to read this. Why is it sweating in your hand? Because one is so anxious to give it to someone as soon as possible, and they don't want it in their hands anymore. Remember earlier we spoke about there's the positive and the negative, the ashray versus the woe. Happy is he versus cursed is he. So the commentary over here suggests that maybe we should be reading it like that. Happy is the one who treats it that way. But woe, at the same time, the dedicate challenges the giver. 
to use your discernment regarding to whom he gives money. The Apostolic Constitution adds, saying, so that the holy be preferred, which implies that the needs of the community should actually be considered first. A disciple of the master should hold on to his money until he finds a worthy cause to which to give it. We are not to give hastily. While in the earlier passage, the receiver is warned of the consequences of receiving charity when it is not in need. Here the giver is told to know to whom to give it. Indeed, blessed is the one who freely gives charity. But at the same time, the dedicate teaches that he should do so wisely using cautions, uh, caution, prudence, and also common sense. So maybe it's a balance. Now, I would argue and say, I don't think that applies to a two rand that you give to a guy at the robot. Do you really think for two rand you should be considering what the guy's going to do with two rand? Mm -hmm. I think this is speaking about bigger donations. Because it says here, the Apostolic Constitution's commentary points out that first the community comes first. So I think this is bigger donations. This is like working out your tithes, for example, and other forms of tzedakah, massive ones like that. I don't think it's talking about little small giving things. Because the, the idea of giving small things, I think, is even more important than giving big things. Because it changes you as a person. We've got a little thing there stuck at the tzedakah box at the wall that says, uh, it's got a little parable that's, is it better to give one rand every day or 365 rand at the end of the year? One rand, one rand every day, because, because it teaches you to become a giving person. And if we're all giving that guy at the robot that you know is sniffing you two rand, you're enabling him, and he will, his life will be worse. I mean, how do you... I don't know if it'll be worse. Why is sniffing you? If you don't give him anything, then he's going to die. <laughs> Sometimes sniffing you keeps him alive, eh? <laughs> Cigarettes and stuff, you, you can't eat. If, <laughs> if you can't eat, I mean, that stuff helps you get through the day. But practically... I mean, it, it's not like we all just carry around our money in our pockets. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. you know, in the absence of them standing on the corner with something you can tap your card, you know, <laughs> you might have money, but you can't necessarily give yes. to every person on the corner. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you not giving? No, no, no. Or, you, you, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. You have, mm. but you're not giving. Technically. So, according, according to the letter of the law. That's what I'm saying. Practically, I don't yeah. really know. According to the letter of the law, yes. I mean, I get a, the, the, the supermarkets to exchange for the coins, but can you still even go to the bank give me like five, give me like a whole bunch of five minutes? So sometimes I go to the mall specifically so I can use that machine to get change. So I can have change to give to the guys. Those machines for parking, when you pay for parking. And now they started giving notes back. Ah. So now I have to stay there just until the, uh, the hour's finished. Then, ah, two rand. Well, well, dish out your notes. <laughs> I, yeah, I do that now. I do that now. Ask Becca. Judah. Oh, man. The Judah doesn't take coins anymore. He sees, so <laughs> in the front of my car, I've got the place where I keep the notes now. And Judah says, Oh, that's for me. I'm going to go buy sweets. And I said, No, it's not for you. And I explained to him. And he says, Okay, well, I want the one with the leopard on it. <laughs> Typical kids. <laughs> John wanted to add something. Oh, the 200. Yeah, I was just thinking. Yeah, 200. I don't think that we should give money to those people standing there with sweet coins. Mm. The reason being that. Uh, we have to repair the world. Yeah. Right? Now, uh, in the old days, probably you give it to the person in the street corner in your village because you know this person. Mm -hmm. right? But these people, you are as uh, you are enabling a system where people actually go and deposit these guys there. I mean, you know, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like uh, I was just telling someone, you know, uh, I got fished the other time with, uh, you know, that prank call. Oh, yeah. To help themselves to my bank account. Um, <laughs> I, I, the thing is that many of these people who are making these calls are kind of like working in a call center. Yes, 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 100%. And some are so unintelligent that they don't know that they're in the process of committing a crime. Yeah. But the one who's running the call center is, you know, is actually hiring people. Yeah. Uh, they don't share in these proceeds uh, directly. Mm. They don't get a percentage of how much they scam. Uh, they're doing their work. Mm. So in the same way, um, uh, once you enable something like this, what happens is that people have to kidnap people and so on like this and bring mm. them into a situation like this. Yeah. There was a time where uh, I arrived in Bombay uh, airport uh, with my sister and someone else. And as we were leaving 